Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 109. 109. So exciting. That is exciting. What's even more exciting is that there'll be no Bruce Hornsby on this one because Dave will not be able to make it. Aw, sad Dave. Well, but it's exciting that there's no Hornsby. That is true. But we, we also won't have Ping here, so that's sad. Also, Actually, it's sad that we won't have Dave either. Yeah, all in all sad, but bright side, silver lining, no Hornsby. No Hornsby and an amazing guest. There you go. So, let me tell you about this guy. I um, picked up a book a long time ago all about something called cold reading. And I picked it up because a, a buddy of mine recommended it. Uh, if you don't know what cold reading is, it's like those people who make believe they talk to the dead or you know can tell you something about your ancestors or something like that. And um, this guy, Ian Rowland, just totally debunked how these people do these their crafts, their trickery. And um, knowing, my friend knowing how I felt about it, so you got to read this book. This guy totally outlines everything. Picked it up and read it, fell in love and thought, this is going to be awesome to try to get this guy in the podcast. Not an easy task until a good friend of the SE Village who was friends with Ian put me in touch with him. Well, lo and behold, here we are about to get him on the show, which is pretty exciting. Super exciting. Really nice to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's very nice to join you all. I've been waiting for this for years, if you can believe it, ever since I read your book way back in the day. So I'm really happy we got a chance to be introduced through uh, through our mutual friend there. Yes, I, I've been looking forward to it as well. Um, it, it seems to have, for something that you would think is quite <laughs> quite easy to set up, it's taken us several months to get here. I'm not quite <laughs> sure why, but it was... Um, it's one of those things. I feel yeah. like that's always I think the it's case. called life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life gets in the way. Now, I did a little introduction about your, your book on cold reading and, and, and how I became interested in your work. But maybe for the listeners, it'd be nice to talk a little bit about who you are and how you got into this particular area of research. Okay. Whenever someone asks me something like that, I'm reminded of the very old Monty Python sketch where they say, I think it's something like summarize all of Proust in 30 seconds or something. <laughs> um, not quite sure where to go. So what do I do? Well, um, I have a background. Uh, basically, I'm a professional writer for hire. That's what I do. I'm a writer. <laughs> I've been a writer for 35 years. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it puts food on the table and keeps me away off the streets and away from loose women, as my mother would say. <laughs> um, I also have a background in magic, but it's not my job. And I'm going to pause to emphasize that because I think <laughs> I have found it's quite useful to do so. It is not how I earn a living. Um, I am a member of the magic circle. In fact, <clears throat> I'm a member of the inner magic circle. Um, and I like it. And I, do, I, don't, I, I don't do things with doves. I do the sort of mind reading magic that some people have, may have seen. It's technically called mentalism. And it's not what I do for a living, but I, it's, a, it's a great part of my life. And I'm almost constantly <laughs> flitting around the world, visiting various magic conventions. They're great fun. Some of them take place in America. And they're great fun. And I love the magic community very much, but it's not what I do for a living. And uh, as well as writing, I run a couple of websites and I do a lot of corporate talks and training. And I have a nice, neat list of sort of big company names like most people do. I talk about various subjects and I try to integrate bits of magic and mentalism with what I do because I find it adds a bit of color and interest and it can be a very good way to, can be a visual metaphor or a good way of getting a point across that you know might not be quite as interesting if presented another way. So that's me. That's what I do. And as for cold reading, that just came up when I was uh, very much younger than I am now. And I was learning about magic and, and mentalism and mind reading. And one day, one of my mentors told me about cold reading. And I became fascinated. And I started trying it out. And I discovered, oh, this actually works. Wow. Who would have thought? And I've, it's just an interest that I've persisted with uh, ever since. And then in 1999, I decided to write a, a book about it. Can you define it? What is cold reading? Yes, I can. Cold reading is how to talk to people so they think you're psychic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. So every person listening to this, every person uh, in the world has either had the experience of going to see someone who says, you know, I, I offer some sort of psychic reading. It can be tarot cards. It can be palm reading, whatever, astrological reading. 
the sort of props and the dress, the theatrical dressing varies. But the basic idea is you sit down with someone who's a complete stranger and they apparently are able to tell you all about your life, your character, events, past, present and future, and offer a bit of a few homely words of wisdom. That's a, a psychic reading. Um, and I, so everybody listening to this either has had that experience or you know someone who has. And they came back saying, it was absolutely amazing. I'm a complete stranger to this person. And they were able to tell me all about myself. And it sounds very weird and impressive. And uh, there are precisely uh, two possible explanations for this. If you want to get scientific about it, one is that they have been to see someone genuinely possessed of a psychic ability of a kind which conventional mainstream science uh, as yet hasn't really come to terms with and can't explain. Or option B, um, they have the, 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 the psychic, in inverted commas, was using what we call cold reading, which is giving somebody a reading cold without any prior knowledge or information or anything like that. So that's what it is. Nice. When you talked about it, it was talking to someone to make them believe you have these talents. And how did you learn how to do that? Well, um, we're going back now to my mid to late teens. Um, first of all, I, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by this when, it was in, when I was just introduced to the theory of it. Um, and at the time, I was learning everything I could about magic. It was quite, it was a, only a pastime, a hobby, but it was a fairly passionate one. So I was learning about card tricks, and I was learning about rope tricks, and I was learning about stage illusions, I was learning about everything, and mind reading tricks. And then I was told about cold reading, which there really isn't, it's the only thing in magic where there's no difference between the effect that is as perceived by the, the outsiders and the method, what's actually going on. You talk to people, they think you're psychic, and they give you money. So I thought this sounded quite interesting. Uh, I read everything I could about the subject. And that, by the way, this was before the internet. This was before Google. So this involves sort of writing by mail to obscure people and publishing houses and on all four corners of the world uh, just to get back some heavily photostatted Xerox. 14th generation Xerox copy little pamphlet or leaflet. I, I ended up with shelves upon shelves of these tatty pamphlets and, and plus some nice good books. I just read everything I could about it, absorbed as much as I could, and then crucially started trying it out. Not for money. Let me emphasize that. I've never charged for a reading. And I found that it was a, a, a remarkable, a remarkably sort of psychologically convincing illusion. You can talk to people and make statements. And they think um, that they're meaningful. I mean, the basic uh, psychology of it is, is really quite fascinating. You're making statements, but you're allowing the person you talk to to find the significance. So normally when we talk to people, I'm providing the statement and the significance. With cold reading, I provide the statement, but you provide the significance. And that's what makes it remarkable. Um, it's one of the oldest uh, such demonstrations that we have. We know that pretty much... Every civilization you can think of, all through history, all over the world, there has been some form of cold reading. As I say, the props and the theatrical dressing change. I mean, that's cultural. Sometimes it's tarot cards. Sometimes it's the I Ching. Sometimes it's astrology. Sometimes it's crystal ball. Sometimes it's palm reading, handwriting, uh, graphology, all sorts of things. But the basic idea is the same. You're a complete stranger, yet I can know amazing things about your character, your uh, events, past, present, and future, or your, uh, you know, what's going to happen. And it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff. And then I realized that I could transplant some of these techniques into the world of business. In other words, situations where you're not actually trying to convince anyone you're psychic, but you might, for example, be trying to sell somebody something. And uh, I've got a long track record in that area. And I uh, started thinking, hmm, maybe I could use some of these techniques when I'm trying to sell things. And I found that that works just as well. And I call that ACR or Applied Cold Reading, ACR for short. Can you tell us a little bit about the methods of crafting these statements that others are adding significance to? Like, how do you make a statement like that? Well, obviously, I can't do that. I'm a member of the Inner Magic Circle. <laughs> if I did, a hit squad would be sent out very, very quickly. Oh, no. And uh, there would be some, the, a red dot would appear on my head. And then there'd be the sound <laughs> of sniper fire through a, a distant muffled silencer 
and nobody would ever see me again. I'd just be slumped over my desk for having uh, the rules. But it would be so worth it for our listeners. Think about how, how worth it would be. I know. I, I would love to sit here and uh, share everything I know, but I, I'm strictly forbidden for No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, luckily. First of all, by the way, let me say, that's not how the magic circle works. I just want to clarify that. I was being flippant. I was being humorous. That's not what actually goes on in the magic circle. For anyone who does not get British humor. You know, just, let's, just let's clarify that. Just in, um, well, for example, uh, I mean, this, as I say, the psychology of it is quite interesting. I mean, the, uh, in a standard sort of psychic reading, there are certain themes that you know to concentrate on, such as career, health, relationships, and money, which spell a rather nice acronym of CHARM, C-H-R-M, career, health, relationships, money, CHARM. So I can make up a statement about, I mean, for example, um, in this particular conversation, Kat, I've never met you before in my life, correct? Correct. Right, Okay. So under the normal rules of conversation, the rules that we all learn when we, when we become adults and we learn sort of normal social interaction, what would I do in the situation? Well, I would make small talk with you and I'd, I'd try to be the sort of most pleasant version of myself I know how to be and I would ask questions and how are you and what do you do for a living and do you live nearby and so forth. We would ask questions. That's what I would do. That's what you would do. That's what Chris would do. That's what everybody does when you meet somebody for the first time. With cold reading, you make statements instead of asking questions. And this why it seems this is why it sounds so impressive. So I can pick any one of those, career, health, relationships, money. In fact, I wouldn't normally do this in a reading, you know, I, I would control the process, but just for fun, Kat, you can go ahead and choose one of those. Uh career. <laughs> okay. The thing that I can sense about you in terms of your career and professional development, Kat, is the several impressions I'm getting. One is that this has always been very important to you, but it doesn't overrule other things in your life. You know, some people who have obviously got the work-life balance very, very wrong. You're not like that. It sometimes gets a bit out of hand, but basically you have other values that you know matter more to you than your career development. And you, uh, this is something that's quite important to you because if I were to sit down and talk to you about your, your values and what really matters, obviously you do want to get ahead. You do want to develop your career, but it's not always been the sort of be all and end all. Can you relate to that? It's a very generalized statement, right? So yes, I can. <laughs> I know it is now because I'm explaining this. <clears throat> never demonstrate I'll play along. So just moving on. <laughs> so um, I also know that if you look at the period, I'm, what am I getting an impression of here? It's about uh, a month to six weeks ago, uh, you did receive a communication uh, that indicated to you an opportunity uh, that could lead to a change or a development in your career. And you have been thinking about it since, and in fact, talking about it to someone else, like a close friend or something like that. Can you relate to that? Okay, yes. Yeah. Now, what I want to say to you is that this is not, it's not one of those what you would call life-changing opportunities and everything suddenly turns upside down, but it is something that is positive. It's productive for you. It's something that will allow you so a little bit more freedom and a little bit more responsibility, but at a price. And what I want you to do is to be, you will make the right decision, by the way. You'll make a good decision. You have to trust your instincts, trust yourself. You will make the right decision, but do be careful. Remember, one of the things we all learn in life is that wherever there is a, uh, wherever there is a benefit, there is a cost. And you're going to have to evaluate that quite closely because although I have, you know, if you believe in yourself and trust your, uh, you know, your gut instincts, you will make the right choice. It might be difficult at times. There will be a price, but stick it out, take the long-term view, that price will turn out to be well worth paying. Yay. <laughs> well, it's interesting because like, if I am holding a concept in my head. And so the point being that like the people you're speaking with are just constantly applying what you're saying to that concept, yes? Yeah. I mean, Bear in mind that if somebody in a situation like this says, go on then, <laughs> demonstrate cold reading, you have to understand this is a bit like saying, go on, tell me a convincing lie. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> the very fact that you've set it up as a lie, no, you, it's not the same. Isn't it? You're not going to find it as convincing as if you did in a context. Now, if you are someone who happens to believe, and also bear in mind, the only people who pay, or mostly the only people who pay to go for psychic readings are people who are predisposed to believe that there is some point in doing so. So the, the, the bar is set very, very low. Um, and so, you know, in, in most contexts, uh, people aren't there 
sat there unpicking it, thinking, oh, yes, I can see how that technique would work. But um, it's, it's all the same. And then you get into stock lines and uh, qualified wins and all sorts of other techniques. This is why in the book I wrote, there's something like, I don't know what it is. It's a long time since I wrote it. Something like 38 different techniques that are all explained. And these days I teach something called super psychic readings, which has even more principles in. So there's lots and lots of things you can talk about. It's really interesting because your advice is not bad. You know, I, I'm looking at getting a new certification. I have spoken about it. I've spoken about it with Chris, both the husband and the boss version of Chris's in my life. And so this, you know, and and you'll make the right decision. You'll, you know, you'll think really hard about it. Like all of that is solid advice. <laughs> so it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, but the advice is always the same. It's always what we call a qualified win. Yeah. It is going to be good, but not necessarily all good all the time. You have to think about it. And think, things like the doctrine of self-reliance and self-belief, you know, uh, you get out of life what you put into it. If you want some, to achieve something, you're going to have to work for it and so on and so forth. Yeah. It doesn't really matter whether anybody listening to this found that particular minor example uh, impressive or interesting or not. Um, it's not doesn't have to be representative. Cold reading is just a fascinating subject. And when you start applying it to um, the business and sort of work arenas, it, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating the way it works. And it can be a very, very positive thing. I know that at least 50% of the people listening to this will think, oh, but this is terrible. It's all about manipulating people and deceiving them. But it really is not. It can be done in a very ethically positive way. And it, the way I teach it, it's... Um, it's really a, a, the, the world's greatest instant rapport tool is basically the way I teach it in a business context. There is just nothing else that works as well as this does. I think from a social engineering angle, right, now looking at it from like a security perspective, why I personally find it fascinating is um, what I have seen over and over, and I've done it myself when I was new uh, in the industry, but what I've seen over and over from from students that come to class is they feel like they need this unbelievably detailed pretext, right? Like I need to know the last five dogs names that I had and why they died and what my kids, you know, last breakfast was all as part of my pretext when nobody really cares. What was fascinating about that example, right, that you just did with Kat, even though like you said, it's like saying, hey, give me a good lie. What's an example of this um, is it was all general. And even though we knew what you were doing, it still applies to a point that if I had come to you with this belief that you were going to do this reading on me, that that would have been amazing because it was so it, it fit. As you were saying it, I was thinking, yes, this just happened to Kat. She just talked to me about taking this class. She just asked me about <laughs> advancing her career with this certification. And I'm like, it fits. And yet it's so general that I can also apply that to something in my life. If you were saying it to me, there's a very thing that Kat and I just spoke about that will enhance my career and our industry that we're going to be working on. So that general thing, which sounded specific, was not. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me just pick you up on this point about it was very general. Cold reading can be drilled down to be as specific as you want. You can pick out specific names, specific places, dates. It's not a problem. I mean, there's a limit to how much I can sort of demonstrate and explain in, in this podcast, but uh, it is not the case that it is restricted or confined to very general statements. And I, you know, I'm not sort of trying to get into an argument with you about that. That there is plenty of scope to get down to specific details. I mean, I've given more demonstrations about this for the mainstream media than anyone and under more different guises as well. I've been, I've been a tarot reader, an astrologer, a clairvoyant, all sorts of things. Um, because for me, it's, just, it's all the same technique. It's just the, the theatrical dressing that changes. But for example, and I, again, when you rip this thing out of context, it is going to sound lame and it is going to sound pathetic. I just want you to get away from this idea that it's, you're always working in the realm of the, the very general. So Kat, can I just carry on with your reading for a moment? Yes, tell me more. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to pick up on one particular person in your life, um, not necessarily someone you know you're very much in touch with now but uh, uh, someone who has played a significant role. Can you just tell me uh, and everybody who um, who Jennifer is? <laughs> um, I know you've had some social occasions with her. Oh, okay. I, I had a childhood friend and we had our first job together and she went by Jenny. But yes, we have not spoken in a very long time. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said. It's not, not necessarily someone you're, you're, you're seeing sort of every day now, but somebody going back to what a little ways in the past. Yes? Yes. 
and she played quite a significant role in your life in that you got you were working together in your first proper job yeah yes okay there you go that's a specific name yeah <laughs> now how's that done let me so how's that done it doesn't matter whether i get a yes or a no this is the crucial thing so i all i have to do is sound incredibly confident and I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do now is give a very, very simple example. Please, I beg everyone listening to this to understand that this can get more refined, more layered, more nuanced, but we don't have a, a whole lot of time. So in very simple terms, all I have to do is sound very confident and I can pick any plausible name. And in this occasion, for no reason at all, I went for Jennifer. I have no idea, no idea at all whether Kat has ever known someone called Jennifer, knows anyone called Jennifer or Jenny, it doesn't matter. It's entirely irrelevant. So I make my statement, da -da 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 -da, Jennifer. So now we've got a nice, hard-edged, specific piece of information. And as it happened, Kat knows, knew somebody, she could find a match. You see, she's finding the significance. Now everybody's wondering, yeah, but what if Kat says no? I don't know anyone called Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I never have. Uh, I, it's the one name I can tell you, I can promise you has never featured in my life. Okay. And I say, <laughs> well, you know, if that person hasn't come along yet, will you look out for that very, very soon? Because I do get a good sense of a significant other person with a name Jennifer or something very close to that that's going to be very important to you, possibly in connection with this new job and career development. So, I, I'll admit, I thought it was someone that had already played a significant role in your life. I, if I was wrong about that, and you say I am, and I accept that, but I, I am getting a very strong sense of that name. So will you look out for that, please, my darling? And there you go, done. And now, this is a time shift. This is what we call the revision of time, where we've gone from the past to the future. And every single uh, cold reader in the world knows that technique. Hey, Kat, let's take a quick break from the show to talk about what's going on in the world of SE. Yeah, busy fall coming up. Huge fall, but we are still recovering from the train that we call DEF CON and Black Hat. Finally, I think, getting some rest from that. Some major things that occurred out there for all of us, but uh, especially with the ILF. If you uh, haven't heard of that, the Foundation, Innocent Lives Foundation, you can check that out, innocentlivesfoundation.org. We had a great speech out there. And a lot of interest uh, due to that. SE Village was another huge hit. Really need to just thank the folks that helped make it happen besides our whole team, which is just amazing. And we constantly get told of how great our team is at SE Village. Uh, we have some really special sponsors that helped us make all the awesome things that we did possible. Uh, know Before, which is good friends of ours. And Stu was out there and so was Perry and, and Kevin. And we got to hang out a little bit at the party. But they came out, and we want to thank them for sponsoring SE Village. Uh, Hillbilly Hit Squad, funny name, but Roberts and Chester and those guys, just amazing uh, group of people that uh, really help us every year with their support. And then back, I think, for the sixth year is Pin Drop. They've been sponsoring us for a really long time, and uh, we're excited to keep seeing them come back each and every year with, with their help and support for SE Village. But it's not all over yet because uh, turning around next month is DerbyCon, and we have a whole SE Village out there, SECTF, the Mission SE Impossible, the Polygraph Challenge, all of those things are going to be out, a couple of panels at the uh, SE Village in DerbyCon. And Kat and I are giving a speech out at uh, DerbyCon too, so you want to come out there for that. And we want to thank Red Sky, because Red Sky is one of our sponsors for the DerbyCon SE Village, and they've been uh, helping us out for the last couple of years too, so we I want to just thank everyone for their support there. Let's see what else is going on. By the time this podcast comes out, I'm hoping to have the dates for our next year's training. But I'll give you a little tip just in case you're listening and they're not there. The APSE in Orlando for 2019 will be in February. And um, if you've been through APSE ready, check your mailboxes for MLSE invites. And then we'll probably be in the June time frame for APSE in the UK. I think that's about all we got going on right now. I mean, that's a lot of things, but I do think you have summarized them well. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. If not, we'll catch up next 
next month on the podcast. You can check out uh, the new book, Social Engineering, The Science of Human Hacking. You can pick that up on Amazon. I want to thank Ben Rothke for the really, really tremendous review that he just wrote on the book. And you can check that out on Amazon or we'll have some info about it on our site. I think that's about it. Let's get back to the interview with Ian. Why, why I still feel that that applies, it makes me think about a time that we were uh, seeing ourselves into a building. And um, I, I had no knowledge of what you just did as a, as a science or an art or anything. So this was just dumb luck. But when you were doing this, it made me think of this where somebody asked, who's your contact here? And how did you get into the building? And I just threw out a general name. And I said, well, James, James is the one who approved it. And they said, what, Jimmy, Jimmy Smith approved your, and I'm like, yes, of course it was Jimmy, you know, and it was just like a dumb luck to throw out a name. And I picked my middle name because it was just the thing that popped in my head. And there just happened to be someone named Jimmy Smith. But soon as they said, Jimmy Smith, I was like, yeah, of course it was Jimmy. And I was thinking if they didn't, you know, in my head afterward, if they didn't have a Jim, James, somebody there that I would have just played dumb and been like, oh, I, I'm sorry. I always get names messed up. Yeah, it wasn't Jim. It was Bob. I'm a moron kind of thing. And that is fascinating that you're doing that. And I was actually thinking, oh, man, what if Kat doesn't have a Jennifer in her life? What's Ian going to do? You know, I'm, I, in my head, I was like waiting. I was actually hoping maybe she doesn't have a Jennifer. What's going to happen? Yeah. As I say, what I just used was the time revision. I have seven of these. And, and effectively, that's just seven broad categories. Effectively, I have an infinite number of revisions or ways out. So I can make any statement I want with complete confidence because the joy about cold reading when you learn it is <laughs> you're never, ever wrong. Or never, put it this way, you're never <laughs> completely wrong. Um, at, at worst, you're just slightly off. As I say, I have seven or eight, effectively an infinite number of revisions and outs. And when you've been doing it for long enough, and I've been doing this for about 30 years now, um, you've always got one to mind. You know? So uh, I can literally make any statement about anything. It's, really, it's honestly not a problem um, because if it's a hit, it's a hit. And if it's not, I know how to turn it around so that it sounds like I was partially correct. And I'm happy to demonstrate that morning, noon, and night. And in, in some of these conventions I go to, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> I end up giving readings in the bar. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think what's fascinating about it is, is, like you said before, we all know what you're doing. You explain it. You just give us a whole rundown. This is exactly how it works. And then you do an example. And even though the knowledge that it is what you are about to do is there because you just explained it, we're all still sitting there going, whoa, that still was amazing because you literally just read cat. Let, let, let me dive in there. I mean, you're being sort of very kind and genial about it. There will be people listening to this who are thinking, well, I didn't think it was very good. I thought that sounded really lame and obvious because we're ripping it out of context and sort of shining a light on it. When cold reading is used in real life, that context is it, 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 supported by this scaffolding, this infrastructure of prior belief and of context. You know, if you go and see somebody who is a so-called professional reader, tarot reader, or whatever, and you are at least slightly predisposed to think there's something to it, and they have the right look and the right feel and the right atmosphere, and they welcome you into their cold reading den or whatever, and the certificates on the wall from the California School of Psychic this, that, or the other, I mean, it's different, you know, there's a different, a different set of psychological expectations are brought to it. And bear in mind, the, the, the other context, as I say, is, is business and, and professional uses. So context makes a huge difference. It's one thing to fillet this out of real life and sort of just put it on a podcast and say, go on, demonstrate that trick you do. And of course, it sounds like a trick. But when you put it back in the context, it flies and it works. I think the a really crazy part of even the framing that this is a trick and I know it's happening to me is having you say these things. I feel my brain start taking them and running with them. Like I felt my brain start filing people named Jennifer, like who do I know? And it didn't really matter that this was like, that I knew this was happening to me. My brain just kind of went off making these statements apply. It was very, very, very interesting feeling internally. <laughs> And tell, tell me, Kat, what was the collection that you currently have or that you had when you were younger? I mean, some, some women collect sort of porcelain cats and things like that or 
you know, some young boys collect stamps and coins, but yours, yours wasn't that. It was something that has a more creative edge to it. What was that? <laughs> um, <laughs> my grandmother gave me a bell every year from like one to 30. Right. You see, some people would still have this on display in their home and some people would have it in a case or a box or it's locked away. They can get it out when they want to, but it's not on display. And for some reason, I'm, I'm being given that this isn't actually, if I walked into your living room, it's not the first thing I would see. But if I asked to see the bell collection, you could get it for me, yes? Uh, I actually don't know. I think it's in my mom's house and I really hope my grandmother doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No Thanks, problem. Chris. <laughs> Um, and we haven't even discussed how you use it in a, you know, outside of the psychic context, but in the in sort of, uh, you know, the business and professional thing, which is a site called ACR. That works really well. Uh, if you are any kind of professional salesperson, if you're running your own business or whatever, if you're calling on a prospect, of course, you want you would normally try to be very well briefed and well informed and who you're going to meet and what they do at that company and their market or industry or whatever. And you would want to be very well briefed. And that's great and fine and dandy when it works. But sometimes you just can't be. And you have to call without great, a huge depth of knowledge. Uh, and this was even more of a problem in the days before Google. So, um, you know, again, you can just, uh, there's ways of doing that, conventional ways of doing that. You can just be pleasant and nice and be a good salesperson. And you can use your spin selling and ask your questions and elicit the need and detect the pain and try to posit your position your service or product as the answer to that and all the rest of it. And in addition to that, and I'm not taking those options away, in addition to that, you can foster great rapport by making statements that the person you're talking to will relate to, just like the psychic flavored statements we've already talked about, but these would be business flavored ones. And by making those statements and the person you're meeting, uh, you know, relates to them and can say, yes, yes, that you're exactly right. You are immediately fostering very strong, very good rapport. You're establishing trust. Uh, you're establishing your own role. You know, if you want to be seen as, oh, the, the world's most helpful salesperson with regard to X, Y, or Z, um, that's how you will come across. It's just, and you can do this in 15 seconds or less. It's incredibly rapid just by making a couple of statements that the person you're talking to uh, can relate to. It works in exactly the same way. It just doesn't come across as you being psychic. It comes across as you being incredibly well informed about your job. So that's really fascinating from a social engineering perspective as well, because when you explain social engineering to somebody who may be unfamiliar with the practice or even those that may have some knowledge, they immediately go to this place of, well, aren't you just selling stuff? Aren't you just selling a story? Isn't this applicable to marketing? And like, it absolutely is. Um, but that it goes so much deeper and so much farther beyond that kind of, you know, analogous to your using cold reading in business, psychic, learning, all of these different realms. So it is really fascinating to hear these parallels from you that you may not have realized existed, but like even in some of the trainings we give, um, the, these same principles are called on. Yeah, the, the, they are wonderful principles and they can be applied to so many different contexts and so many different situations. And I, I feel that there's a little bit of a shame that cold reading, when it's usually discussed, if it's discussed at all, is within the psychic context, which personally, I find the sort of least interesting aspect of it, and particularly because, as I say, the bar is set so low. It's really not that difficult to set yourself up as a psychic. But if you want to try and use it in a business and, and professional context, it, you have to work a little harder. And I, I think the challenge is a bit more interesting, quite honestly. Uh, and in my own experience, I'm the former UK head of sales and marketing for quite a big organization. And for the past 20 or 21 years, I've run my own business. And I, I, I guess I, in one way or another, I think I use cold reading every single day. Yeah, I think there's just so many applications to our industry, you know, like in listening to you talk about it. Um, you know, many times, like you said, our, our goal is to build rapport and trust with people. Um, our goal is to test vulnerabilities for companies. Right. And to do that, we test the human vulnerabilities, so not the not the technical vulnerabilities. And and to really do that well, our job is to get people to trust us and then get them to do something that they really shouldn't do from a security standpoint. And, um, you know, and that means like having to having to be comfortable in your pretext and being able to do, you know, walk in and talk to people and do the very things that you just did. You know, before, like I said, very general to start off with. 
Um, and I think that applies more to maybe to SE than it does to cold reading because you come in with too many details and you get somebody thinking. And as soon as they start thinking, you know, from a, from a social engineering angle, you've kind of lost the gig because they, they now are just thinking about what you're saying and you don't want that. But then I can also see how we can apply your later advice, you know, how after you built that rapport, getting a little more detailed, getting a little more friendly, giving a little more information. We call that quid pro quo, you know, giving them a little bit more about you and why you're there would definitely help keep that rapport and trust flowing. Yeah. The great joy of it, it, it for me is that it all springs, springs from one difference, one crucial difference. It's the difference between asking questions and making statements. If you make statements to somebody you've just met that they find uh, positive and that they can agree with and, and substantive, um, the 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 bridge that you're building incredibly rapidly, as I say, within 15 seconds, is very very strong indeed, and it's a very underused and underexplored uh, principle, I think. So I would argue, Chris, uh, let. You know, I've even heard you use this statement concept. I know that many of the team have used this, myself included, in particularly Vishing, where we will make a statement based on details that we know about a client. Um, so it's not exactly the same. It's not who is your Jennifer, but it is, you know, oh, you're using that Dell again, I see. Um, so I, I think that there is actually a really strong parallel here in social engineering and using, like, having that use of statements to build your rapport and craft your frame. Um, that's really fascinating. It is definitely a different application, but a lot of similarities are there. Yeah, but the, I mean, crucially, uh, the difference is whether you're making a statement based on actually knowing something or yeah, that's knowing fair. nothing at all. Yeah. I personally have always found great delight in making statements about things I know nothing about. <laughs> it's, how, it's how I got through in my entire high school and college <laughs> career. Because you can also use this for passing <laughs> exams. <laughs> and I did. Yeah I, yeah, I have a degree in a subject I know nothing about, thanks to this. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I am not joking. I have a degree in a subject I know nothing about. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> That is amazing. And I, I find it fun. I, I, I've got to the point where I actually find it a slightly prosaic, slightly dull option to talk about things I actually know about. I find, <laughs> I, I find, it, I find that kind of like a, a lazy day. You know, it's just not working hard enough. I, um, that's like, you know, bench pressing 10 pounds. It's, it's just not, not, it's not enough of a challenge. I'd much rather talk to somebody I, I know nothing about. I love, I love social occasions. Whether they're business meetings or just social occasions where I'm talking to somebody, so, oh, you know, what do you do for a living? They mention something I know nothing about. And then I have a, convers a sustained conversation with them for 10 minutes about this thing I know nothing about. You know, I, I find that great fun. And it's, again, it's rapport, it's, it's building, it's warmth, it's connecting, it's bridges with people. So at that point, are you asking a lot of questions to get them talking? Or how, what is your methodology for having a conversation with no knowledge? Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, the, in any normal social interaction, if I'm not particularly trying to use cold reading, of course you can ask questions. As I say, making small talk and asking polite questions is what we're all trained to do. As soon, ever since you learned some adult social skills, that's what you've been doing. So, of course, there's scope for that. All I'm saying is that if they happen to mention something that I know nothing about, I figure there's a couple of options there. One is to say, oh, really? Well, I, I don't actually know much about that. Tell, tell me about it. And, of course, you know, it's very, very often very nice to shut up and, and listen to the other person and, and let them do the talking. All I'm saying is, as, as well as that option, there is another one, which is to uh, set myself the challenge of talking to them about it for 10 minutes, even though I don't actually know anything <laughs> about it. I just think that's a fun, interesting challenge. I like it. <laughs> and it might be the right thing to do. A, a lot of rapport building is just, you know, shut up and listen. Listen to the other person. Take a genuine interest. Listen to their story. Of course, that's important. All I'm saying is that from time to time, that's a little bit dull just to say, I'm sorry, I don't actually know much about aerospace. So tell, tell me about that. It sounds fascinating. Sometimes I might like to say something about aerospace for the next 10 minutes. Um, and when, back in the day when I was doing more selling, business to business selling, this, this was a very, very useful thing to be able to do. I remember I, when I was very young and I was sent to see somebody who worked at, uh, I won't name the brand, but there, it's a huge company that makes various kinds of glue and adhesive and that kind of thing. And unfortunately, and this was before the internet, um, before Google, I didn't know anything about this industry at all. 
And I had the sales meeting, and I think it lasted about 45 minutes. And then I came back to the office, and my boss called me in, and he had had a phone call from the person I'd just been meeting, you know, whilst I was making my way back to the office. This person, phone up, he said, well, that was quite an interesting young man you sent to see us. How did he know so much about our industry? My boss said, how, how do you know so much about glue and adhesives and this sort of thing? I said, I'm, to be honest, I don't know anything about it at all. <laughs> 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 but it just seemed a bit lame in that context just to say that, you know, I'm sorry, I don't actually know much about glue. Tell me about it. It sounds fascinating. I, um, I'd, I'd just prefer to actually talk about it. So you, you wrote a book on it. What's the name of the book that you wrote about this, this topic? Well, I, I wrote a book on the psychic side, the, the psychic flavored version of it. I called it the Four Facts Book of Cold Reading. I wrote it in 1999. I've done about five or six editions ever since. And uh, I'm sure people can find it somewhere. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's really, it's a description. It's a descriptive book. It's not, a, it's not really a textbook or a how-to, although you can use it that way. But it's a description, it's a sort of analysis. How does cold reading work in the psychic context? Now, the other stuff, how it applies, how you apply it to business and things like that. I haven't actually written a book on that. I have taught it in classes and online. Um, you know, sometimes I teach it by Skype, but I haven't actually written that out in book form as of yet. But yeah, I, I suppose if somebody were interested, you could take the full facts book of cold reading and sort of see, okay, that's how it works in the psychic. A realm, but you could you could begin to see how you might apply it to other contexts as well. So I have to. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a shout out. You've mentioned a couple of times how this practice can be viewed as manipulative, but uh, but you'll never take money for it, and you don't use it in that manner. And also your statement about at the dinner party when you set these goals of listening to somebody actively for ten minutes, and that actually leaves them feeling really nice. Um, I think that for our industry, this is extremely applicable and this is a very strong parallel. Um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about the ethics in social engineering and our in-house philosophy is that we want to leave everybody that we touch feeling better for having met us, that there is either a tangible learning goal or they feel positive from the experience they had with the social engineer, whether or not they knew that that exists. And so I just, I love the idea that even throughout all of these slight these industries and these roles and these practices that can be viewed as manipulative that there's also some inherent beauty and some really lovely ways you can give back with them and it's just kind of the mindset that you enter into the practice with and so i think that's a really important parallel to draw is that all of these things can be used to make people feel very good and not an inauthentic good because you know when you went back back to the, your very first example of my career growth you know as we said, those pieces of advice, like you have to work hard to manifest this. That's good advice. You know, I tell myself that pretty frequently. So I just think it's really powerful to keep kind of going back to the fact that these skills are powerful skills and they can be used for good. So thank you for all of your, uh, your points there in that vein. Yeah, it, it is important to emphasize doing these, doing this or anything else in an ethically positive way. Some people are quite skeptical about that, but, uh, you know, we always go back to the philosophical argument about the surgeon's knife. I mean, a, a sharp knife is just a sharp knife. It can be used for harm, uh, but it can be used for good in the hands of a skilled surgeon. It can save your life. And whether you're talking about manipulating other people in general, or whether you're talking about social engineering, or whether you're talking about cold reading, uh, you can use it for harmful purposes, and some people do, uh, but you can use it for very beneficial purposes. And that's what I try to teach, and that's what I try to focus on. That's awesome. So if people wanted to find out more about your, your courses that you teach or about the, the work that you're doing now, where, where can they go to, to follow you and find out more about that? Um, well, they can go to a couple of places. They can just type my name into Google. That will be a good start. Um, <laughs> ignore all the nasty stuff to see the good stuff. Um, they can go to the, the – not that there is any nasty stuff. Of course, everybody on the internet, all everybody, every man, woman, and child on the internet thinks I'm great. Um, they can go to the cold reading. They can go to the coldreadingconnection.com, and they can also go to ianroland.com when that website is up. At the time of our conversation, uh, it's not. There's reasons for that, but it will be uh, rising again like a phoenix from the flames. There will be, I promise you, there will be an ianroland.com. 
um, within a matter of days or weeks. It's just down for the moment, but it will be coming back. So by the time this podcast is out in the second uh, Monday of September, they will be able to go to ianroland.com and, and check that out too. <laughs> I, I am hopeful that that might be the case. It might take a little longer, but it, it will. The, at some point, there will be. I will have a website again. Yeah. Excellent. Now, with something we we have a lot of people who listen to the podcast who love to read. I'm sure they'll be checking out your book on uh, cold reading if they haven't already. Um, if you have a recommendation, it doesn't even be about this topic, right? It could be anything that you found fascinating in your life and career. But we like to ask our guests if they can recommend a book um, for our our listeners to read. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to re- I'm going to stick to an extremely boring choice. There's nothing original. There's nothing fresh about this. But I, I'm staggered by the number of people who think they are interested in all of this area, but they haven't read it. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, that's a that's a classic and a great book. Um, I'm typing that in now. Yeah, and it, it, there's just so much in there that still works and still applies. And I talk to so many people who say they're interested in the psychology of this or rapport that or whatever. And I say, have you read Carnegie? And they say, no. What's that? It's just the foundation text. Everything else follows from that. And what's amazing about um, uh, Dale Carnegie's book is how timeless it seems to be because he wrote that. I don't even know the, the date that it was published, but I know it's quite old. Um, I know I've read it. I, I was reading it back when I was in a salesperson, like in my 20s. Yeah, it's a long time ago. So I know that it's been around for quite a while. It has, and it's a wonderful book. And as I said, I, I consider it a kind of a foundation text for anything else in this area that people might want to get into. Start with Carnegie and then you know get into the more detailed stuff. 1936. That's wow. Crazy. Are you kidding? Yeah, me? I'm not kidding. 1936. I just looked it up. That's crazy. Sounds about right. Wow, that is like back in like William Marston time. There, that is unbelievable. I did not know it was that old. Yeah, Dale Carnegie. Yeah, going back away. That to me is even more fascinating that it is so timeless and how these principles still apply and work, uh, despite it. Despite mm-hmm. that, the, the whole world has changed since the 30s and 40s uh, to now, but yet these principles still work and can be applicable today. Yeah, the, the principles of getting people to like you and influencing people are the same because people are fundamentally the same. And that's that's what it's all about. It's a wonderful book and it's very easy to read. And yeah, there's thousands of others like you. I have I have the kind of house where if you took everything away apart from the books, it would still stand up. <laughs> you know, loads and loads of books. But that's 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 one of the more important ones. I, I agree. Hey, Ian, this was a fascinating podcast. And even despite the British humor, which I'm sure a few people will get, I think it was still great. And and I learned. I apologize for being British. I did consider changing my nationality before we did this, but it, 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 I just didn't run out of time. I thought that all. was part of the request when we sent you the podcast request was to change your nationality to something not British. But yeah, I just <laughs> ran out of time. I'm sorry. I, I did. I was going to be Ukrainian for this, yes. but I just Man. yeah didn't work you out. Really dropped the ball, Ian. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, I mean, sorry. I've let I've let myself down. I've let you down, and I've let the listeners down. And I apologize. But, Ian, I, I can see there's something great in your future coming. Really, there's someone, someone you're going to meet that's going to just rock your world and is going to make your life so much better. I could see that. That's the other thing that happens every single time I run a cold reading class or teach it online. The people can't resist immediately trying to use it on me. I, every time, every time I actually teach a live class of this and I get a group of people together in some training room somewhere, the worst thing is the lunchtime. Because at lunchtime, everybody's just trying to get everyone else all the time. And I have to say, look, time out. This is lunch. This is a break. You know, just chat about anything else. Then we'll go back into the classroom. We'll do the second half of the course. But no, people just can't resist using it, using it straight, which, yeah, is part of the fun. Yeah, that's epic. <laughs> Thank you so that's much amazing. for your time today. And I'm sure this will be one of the classics that uh, people will enjoy listening to over and over again. Oh, you're just flattering me. Now. I'm sure it'll be <laughs> forgotten. But thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Chris. Thank you so much, Kat, as well, for your time. And thank you to people for listening. And, of course, if anybody wants to know anything more about it, I'm very easy to find and to contact. Thanks, Ian. Another epic podcast, Kat. So amazing. I really appreciate the guests who give us tangible takeaways. Like I just can't get over how real his cold reading felt, even though we knew what he was doing. 
I also found it kind of fascinating how um, that he said, he tells us, I'm going to pick some really general things that will match. And while he's doing it, I'm trying to play along in my head, even though he's cold reading you, I'm trying to, and I'm like, yeah, you know, there are some things in my head that would actually match those statements completely different than yours. But I'm like, yes, that fits. Yeah. It is a little eerie and fascinating um, to realize how non-unique. Predictable? Yeah. Yeah, predictable. (laughs) That's a better word than not unique. (laughs) I was thinking of that, but yeah, how predictable we are. Yeah, it's crazy. I would be, I would love to take his class. So much same. Yeah. Just to see like what more we can learn. Can you imagine like a whole day of that? Uh, only in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, that, that may be that may be the only time we ever get to do it is in our dreams. <laughs> I don't know. Make it happen, boss. Come You're on. gonna try. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I think uh, you know, if we have to tame his British humor, see if we can turn you know. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. Is that a type of humor that needs taming or does it just need like amplifying? I don't I don't really know what the way to handle British humor is. <laughs> I don't know how many British people are listening right now, so I'll hold my tongue. <laughs> I mean, I love you, British people. <laughs> and your humor. Yes, and your humor. And you see, that was a joke. So. <laughs> oh, let's see. <laughs> uh, good times. Well, um, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. I know we did. And if you want to check out more, you can on iTunes, Spotify, or right directly on the website, social-engineer.org. If you want to check out our corporate side of the company, it's social-engineer.com. On Twitter, you can follow Kat at... Kat Murdoch, that's C-A-T, and the O is a zero. Or myself at Human Hacker, and the corporate um, account is SOC Engineer Inc. I think that's about almost every way to get a hold of us. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys with your feedback, comments, criticisms, or critiques. And we'll also look forward to touch and base next month. See you. Stare through the embers on the 1st of November and remember you were born.